Looking at aircraft hydraulic systems, we have, these are all, hydraulics are contained in ATA chapter 29. 29 is going to contain the main core of the hydraulic system, okay? The parts that make up the system itself. What does that mean? What may not be, what's not necessarily covered in 29? What do you think? The what? So the landing gear itself, right? Maybe the landing gear actuator, or maybe like a flight control actuator. They will, that, like the removal and installation or maintenance of a flight control actuator is probably going to be in 27 flight controls. Removal and installation of a landing gear actuator or a brake is going to be in 32. It's going to be in landing gear. Okay? So this is the stuff that basically produces the hydraulic pressure and distributes it everywhere. The actual users are typically included, the hydraulic components that are part of a user system are included with that, whatever that system might be. So hydraulic fluid is considered, it's kind of the lifeblood of the aircraft. It's what makes the aircraft move and operate. Without hydraulics, most transport aircraft have no way of operating the flight controls, for instance. There is no physical connection between the yoke or the side stick, if it's an Airbus, and the flight controls themselves. If you have no hydraulics whatsoever, you have no ability to move the flight controls. So they are critically important that they function, and so they have many layers of redundancy and backup in order to make sure that happens. So they drive things like primary and secondary flight controls. They're going to operate your landing gear, both extension and retra retraction and extension, braking, ground steering, on a lot of airplanes, they operate the thrust reversers to help to stop the aircraft when it lands. They can also run generators. You can have generators that run off the hydraulic system. You have doors. We've seen, we've operated the doors on the 727 that run off hydraulics, as well as things like stairs. Okay. So in its simplest forms, hydraulics are basically using pressure, using fluid and the fact that fluid is non-compressible to transfer energy. Okay. Essentially liquids in motion and their application and engineering, practical applied hydrodynamics, using fluids to do work. And at its most basic form, when you look at a hydraulic system, there it is written out. You have to have some kind of a pressure source it gets energy from somewhere, converts that into pressure. That fluid under pressure is going to move through a conveyance path. You're going to control its flow. And then it's going to make something do work. It's going to actuate something. So at its very, very basic level, this is a hydraulic system. They get much more complex when we put them in an airplane. So in large aircraft or in transport aircraft, I say large, but this applies to, to regional jets, corporate aircraft, you know, so larger aircraft, larger than general aviation. You have what's called a constant pressure variable flow system. So we always want to have that pressure available. When a pilot or you as an operator goes and moves you know, moves a flight control, moves the stick, you want that flight control to move instantly, right? When you move the rudder pedals to steer the nose as you're taxiing, you want those wheels to steer as soon as you start moving the pedals. You don't want to have to move the pedal and then have hydraulic pumps come on and then have to have it build up pressure and then finally it steers the nose because by that point you're going through the dirt, right? When we've run the, some of you have run the 727, you've all run hydraulics, you saw it took time. When we turn the hydraulics on, it doesn't instantly go to 3,000 PSI. It takes a second to ramp up. We don't have time for that to ramp up. When a, when a pilot's coming into land and they have to make all kinds of small adjustments coming into the runway, they don't have time for it to ramp up every time they move the stick a little bit. So that's where these are, that's where that constant pressure comes in. We want that pressure available now in order to do it. And so the way we do that is 
the, the pressure remains constant, but as we put loads on the system or take loads off, as we activate things or deactivate things, the flow that's needed, the amount of fluid moving is going to change. And so that's where the variable flow element comes in. Most transport aircrafts nowadays attempt to maintain a steady pressure of 3,000 PSI. Some of your newest aircraft have actually gone higher than that, 4,000 or even 5,000 PSI. The A350, the 787, a lot of those run it at those higher pressures. And then a lot of military, anyone work military aircraft? Did, what'd yours run at? Or 4,000? Yeah. So a lot of military aircraft run at higher PSI as well, but commercially you're seeing more of, more of it. Okay. In high demand situations, however, if the pumps can't keep up with the flow, you may see the pressure drop. And that's because the pumps are putting out as much flow as they possibly can. Pressure is a function of the amount of fluid flow that's available into a given space. And as we make a bunch of movement, as we actuate stuff, the space and the system changes. And so the flow can, the, the, the pressure can drop as flow catches up. Have you seen that happen? Anyone seen that happen? No? When you were moving flight controls around during your labs? Or when you turn on the A system? You got the B system on on the 727. What happens when you turn the A system on? You see a big pressure drop until it pressurizes the A system. Right? That's because it's requiring more flow than what those two electric pumps can provide. On the 727, the primary pumps, the, the high flow pumps are the engine driven pumps. Those electric pumps are much lower flow. So it takes some time to catch up. So the flow is varied to match that system demand up to the point where the pumps are delivering as much flow as they possibly can. And then if, it, if flow exceeds their capacity, then you'll get it, you will get a pressure drop in that case. Um, and these are known, they're also known as a closed center hydraulic system. So transport category aircraft use a closed center hydraulic system. A closed center hydraulic system is a constant pressure variable flow system. Most aircraft, or all transport aircraft, I should say, have more than one of these systems. Majority of them, they almost, almost all of them have three, in fact. So Here's an example. This is the Embraer 175. Three systems in this case. Most of them use phosphate ester fluid. What's the, what's the more common name for phosphate ester fluid? Skydraw. Okay. Most transport aircraft use Skydraw. Okay. Phosphate ester based fluid. It's more. Why do we why do we use Skydraw? What are its advantages? Over the alternative, which is what is what's the alternative first of all? 5606, what's the actual, so 5606 is a specific brand, what's the actual like general name for 5606 type fluids? It's close, they're oil based, mineral based, okay. So phosphate ester fluids, Skydraw, why do we use them? They're more temperature stable. They don't expand and contract with temperature changes as much. That's one. What else? They're less flammable. What else? It's purple for fun. <laughs> I don't know if the purple is they dyed it that way or phosphate ester is just naturally purple. But what you'll see in your hydraulic systems is a lot of the fittings and other stuff is purple to tell you it's a phosphate ester system versus red or pink if it's a if it's a, a mineral-based fluid system, a 5606 system. So it's typically purple-ish. The last part is the fluid itself is just more stable. It doesn't break down as quickly over time. Hydraulic fluids, over time, they break down. They lose some of their, their viscosity. They lose, they, they just, they become less good at what they do. Phosphate ester is less likely to do that. So we got three phosphate ester systems that you can see here installed in this aircraft. And they kind of show where these route. So you know, here, and we'll look at the, the details, but here you can see the left system, number one. This is, it's got a, these are pumps right here. So it's got a pump there. What drives that pump? That's an engine driven pump. What about the one that's circled right here? What do you think in the fuselage would drive something like that? That's an electric pump, okay? 
I'm going to skip over system two on the right. You can see that also has an engine driven pump in the right engine, and then it's got an electric driven pump as well. And then you can see where they go on the aircraft, right? So like system one here, it doesn't even go to the ailerons. It goes to some spoilers. It goes back to the left elevator. It goes to the rudder, right? System two, that goes to both ailerons. It goes to some other spoilers. It also goes to the, ele the both elevators in the rudder, right? And then system three, what are these two things right here? What's that? Uh, they're not APU. They're close to the APU, but what do you think they are? They're two, two, more, two electric driven pumps. Any of those electric driven pumps, typically this pump right here, would the, the left pump number one, electric pump one, would be driven off of the number two, the right hand electrical bus. Pump number two would be driven off the left hand electrical bus. Pumps three and four, one, or sorry, three would be, one would be on the left bus and one would be on the right bus. But remember, you have bus ties. You can connect any of those buses together if you lose a generator. So really, any generator can power all those pumps. And the APU generator can be connected as well. And that one powers, you can see both ailerons and that. So a system of, uh, a failure of any one of these systems, do we lose any of our primary flight controls? Do we lose roll control? No, nope. you can fail two or three, and you still have roll control. You fail one, it doesn't even affect the ailerons. Do we lose pitch control? You can, you still get pitch with half of an elevator. So you could actually lose two systems. You could lose three and two, and you'd still get pitch control from one on the left-hand half of the elevator. You wouldn't get as much pitch control, but you'd still have it. Is there a way to roll without two and three? If we lose two and three, how do we roll the airplane? Spoilers. So you, you know, ailerons normally one goes up, one goes down, right? Well, spoilers, you just pop up the one on the downward wing. So in fact, most roll control on transport aircraft is performed by the spoilers rather than the ailerons. The ailerons are really only used during like takeoff landing, slow speed situations. At high speeds, almost all of pitch control is done by just popping a spoiler up just a hair. Because they're going so fast, that little bit of movement is all it takes to roll the plane. Yeah. Uh, it's so older aircraft. The logic is all in like it's it on the on the 727. It's all like mechanical logic. Um, uh, newer aircraft fly by wire. It's tied into it's mechanical logic, and it can have like airspeed like like um, diaphragm valve, airframe, you know, stuff like that, that ports hydraulic fluid differently. Newer aircraft, when you've got um, fly-by-wire, you've got computers that can manage that. And, you know, with fly-by-wire, you're telling, I want to roll the plane left. The fly-by-wire computer figures out what the best way to do that is based on conditions. So, so you can see, you can lose any one of these systems, and you still have every primary control on there. There's a few other things. You can see some going here that go to like landing gear. So systems one and two go to the landing gear. Okay. So this system two, you can see there's more landing gear. That also goes up to the nose. You know, you lose nose wheel steering if you lose system two. But is that a big deal? In flight, no. What about when you land? Still no. You got your rudder, right? Might be a little hard to make the tight turns on the taxiways. What else can you use on the ground? Brakes, right? You might have left and right brakes. What else can you use on the ground? Get the ground crew and tell you. What if you don't want to get the ground crew to tell you? Yeah. You got variable thrust. You can throttle up the right engine to pull the plane left. You can throttle up the left engine to pull the plane right. With wing mounted engines, that's a lot easier. Tail mounted engine will do it, but not as much because it's so close to the center line. It's hard to do it that way. But you got differential braking that's still available from system one there. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways to steer, for instance, even if you lose the fluid going up to the nose there. Right, so you can see where all these redundancies come into play and all these backups come into play. They take it very, very serious. There have been a couple accidents uh, where planes have lost all hydraulics. The most famous one is the Sioux City, Iowa crash. In that case, they had an uncontained fan failure in the tail. It was a DC-10. 
and it took out hydraulic lines for two of the systems, the ones that were run off the left and right engine, and then the engine that blew up in the tail, uncontained fan failure, that was what would have run the third system. The crew was able to fly that plane using the differential thrust of the two side engines. It nearly landed it successfully. They flew it for, I want to say it was almost two hours, and then were able to bring it in at Sioux City and almost landed successfully. And, and the plane rolled over on landing, but they still, a lot, majority of the passengers and crew still survived. So, but it was, they've done it in simulators since, and almost no one's been able to recreate, like, been able to do that in a simulator ever since. So, if we look at these from a schematic standpoint, this is kind of what you see. So, remember we said system one, it had a left engine driven pump and then a right electric pump. They call them AC motor pumps. So, you'll see that the, the, the acronym uh, common in industry, you'll see ACMP, AC motor pump. Okay. You'll see EDP, engine driven pump. Those are kind of your common industry acronyms. EDP, engine driven pump, AC motor pump for the, that. Don't, don't confuse EDP, it does not mean electric pump, electric driven pump, it means engine driven pump. If it's an AC, if it's an electric pump, it's an AC motor pump. So you can see those both create pressure, they go into a manifold. Now we don't show everything here, there aren't like filters and stuff like that, we'll get into that. And then it goes out and it shows all the different items. You know, kind of now we got boxes that show what each one does. And you can see the primary system for the gear is number two, but number one does have an ability to run it using a, a power transfer unit. We'll talk about what that is a little bit later too. But it kind of gives you the layout of what we got here. We've got a, rev a reservoir to hold our fluid, pumps to pressurize it. System three's got the two AC motor pumps. Filter, filter manifold, system manifold, sends fluid out. Now, what part of the system does the, do these schematics not show right here? What are we missing? So we've got reservoir to pumps, out to things. Where does the fluid have to go after it goes out to the different stuff? What? Right back. There's no return shown on this one right here. Okay. So this is kind of a diagram to show you what's powered by what and generally what's what's providing the power and then what systems are being powered by those by those pumps. But remember we said, you know, here's ailerons, right? Aileron, left aileron. Over here, you've got this left hand and right hand multifunction spoiler. Multifunction spoiler means it serves as a flight spoiler and a ground spoiler. Ground spoilers are the ones that all pop up at the same time when the plane lands. To, to dump, wind, to dump uh, lift, it ruins the lift of the wings so the airplane stays on the ground. Multifunction means in the air they can pop up left side or right side by themselves to help with roll control. So that's where that roll control comes even if you lose systems three and two. If I put them side by side, you see something like this, right? So engine driven pump, engine driven pump, AC motor pump, AC motor pump. All the different users, here's those left and right multifunction spoilers, number three and number four. That's these two right here and these two over here. Left and right ground spoilers, these inboard ones, those only work when the plane's on the ground. The, they pop up fully to, to spoil lift on the wing. Then you got your brakes, outboard brakes, upper rudder, left elevator, right? So there's all the different systems. This line right here goes across. That's this, this little double thing here. That's a power transfer unit. That allows system one to drive system two and system two to drive system one without sending fluid between the two of them. The 727, we open an interconnect valve and we port fluid between them. Airplanes don't do that anymore. They've gone and used these, they use these uh, power transfer units right here that allow you to, to use one system to power the other without actually porting fluid across. So there's system two in a little more detail and system three side by side. You can see system three is much simpler. It's much smaller, uh, but even still it can fly the airplane all by itself. So as we've looked at these, some of the things I've talked about, first thing we have to have some kind of an energy source. This can be, it's mechanical. We got to, they're, they're rotational pumps. They spin. Okay. 
It's a mechanical energy source. It can be an electric motor. It can be an engine accessory gearbox. It can be a wind turbine. What's a wind turbine on an airplane? Ram air turbine, right? We talked about an electrical. It can drive a generator. A rat can also drive a hydraulic pump directly. Some aircraft have some aircraft have both. In fact, they'll have a a electrical rat and a hydraulic rat that pop out if they lose everything. They some of them do that. A lot of them do that too. So a lot of them, the electrical rat will come out, the air-driven generator, and then that drives one hydraulic pump. You know, there's six pumps on here, right? Two engine driven, four electrical. In this case, on that aircraft, the Ram Air Turbine powers, I believe, I want to say it's a single number three pump. I can't remember which one. The aircraft I worked on, uh, more, more so than this one, I worked on the 175s a little bit, but the CRJs, the Ram Air Turbine powers a generator, and it powers the three, I think it was the 3B pump. I can't remember if it was 3B or 3A, but the one single pump, which allowed you just enough control to fly the airplane, to glide the airplane to the ground. You're pretty much gliding at that point. What's that? You would have pretty much that. It's very similar. They're very similar architecture between the, the aircraft. Even though they're two different manufacturers, they, they almost have the same setup. The CRJs don't have the power transfer unit, though. Okay. So we've got our mechanical energy source. That's going to power a pump. The pump then has to pull fluid from somewhere. It gets it from a reservoir and sends it out through the conveyance lines, pipes, tubes, flexible hoses, and whatnot. I'm going to skip accumulator for a second, and heat exchangers, we'll come back to those. We then control that fluid, porting it on and off and, and, measure, and, and directing its flow, controlling its flow to drive things like actuators, Actuators are linear, right? Motors that can spin. We can use hydraulics to drive spinny things. Uh, and then there's also the kind of the ancillary items, the accumulators, heat exchangers, filters. Accumulators are kind of like a hydraulic battery. They can store pressure. We'll look at those. They store pressure. They can also be used to smooth. Um, they can smooth spikes and dips in pressure caused by the actuation of components. They can kind of take the place of the pump for a fraction of a second while the pump catches up for an increase in flow. Uh, and then heat exchangers, hydraulics, we're compressing or, or, or compressing fluid, we're moving items, they are going to build up heat, so we have to be able to dissipate that. And then filters are to keep the fluid clean so that if there is contamination that gets in it, it doesn't cause damage to the various components or potentially cause seal failures and that kind of thing. So if we look at our, our types, I mentioned earlier that we're dealing with a closed center system, but you're probably most familiar with open center at this point. These are smaller aircraft, medium and large general aviation, small regional turboprops, and some small corporate jets. These are demand systems, okay? So this is not what we're primarily talking about. It's just to give you a contrast. The pump typically only runs when something's moving, so they're often not used for the most critical flight controls and that kind of thing. They're, they're oftentimes used to extend and retract the gear, right? You bring the gear handle down. It's not like right when you're about to land, right? You bring the gear handle down. There's some time for that gear to lower as the plane's descending. You bring the gear handle up as the plane's climbing out. The gear doesn't have to, you know, it can, you can have a second for that pump to ramp up, for pressure to ramp up, gear to come up. Okay, so things like landing gear and flaps that are not part of your primary flight controls, that aren't actuated and have to be ready to go now. Um, so system pressure here is zero when not needed. And so what happens is normally, you know, they're called open center because the control valves, you can see they're kind of in series with one another, and the valves have a port when they're, when they're not being actuated. There's an open port in the middle that allows fluid to essentially flow. So... You know, what happens down here when we're using it, in this case, we're actuating the second, the second, uh, there's an actuator we're going to move that's on the second valve. You can see fluid actually flows through the open center of the first valve, goes into the second valve, which has now been turned to port it. It's going to push our actuator to the left. Any fluid that was on the left is then going to be able to flow back through that valve, through the open center of the valve, the third valve, and then back to the reservoir. Okay. 
So that's where the term open center comes from, is the valves, when they're in neutral, when you're not actually moving something, fluid is still flowing through them. Okay, so these, the items, the different valves, they're, they're in series with each other because the fluid basically flows through everything before going back to the reservoir. Okay. It's not what we have. Smaller airplanes. This is what the Seminoles use. Our Seminoles out here that have hydraulic landing gear, they use an open center system like this with a, what's called a power pack. It's the reservoir and pump and everything are in one little, one little unit up in the nose. We're looking at closed center. So here's a closed center. So what do you notice that's different about the closed center? That's what? The center is closed, okay. <laughs> what does that mean? What am I talking about by closed center? What center is closed? The valves do not have a port when they are in the neutral position. Okay. How are the valves and components arranged compared to an open center system? Think about electrical terms here. They're what? Open center was in series, so what would that make these? These are in parallel with each other. Okay? Fluid to get to the unit on the right here does not have to, or to get to the unit on the left, that's kind of the last one on our on our, our our series. To get to the unit on the left or the middle, it doesn't have to flow through the unit on the right, right? There's a manifold here where it branches off to go to each one of our valves. So valve A, or fluid, does not have to pass through C and B before it gets to A. It goes through the manifold directly over to A. You can see when the valve is rotated, then we can port fluid to this side, or if we rotate this again, it will port pressure uh, to the other side. We can port pressure to either side of the actuator. Okay with our selector valves. And now what we have is in this side here, the red, after the pump, leading up to each valve, we have 3,000 PSI. That is our pressure side. That's under pressure. Okay? And it's held that way all the time. So it's an always-on system. Our pump is continuously running, which means our pressure is available now. That's why we can use it to drive things like primary flight controls. Because, when the, when, again, when the crew moves, when you move the stick, when you move the rudder, when you move the, the ailerons elevator, you don't have to wait for a pump to ramp up pressure in order to make that, that device move. The way it's set, how we maintain this, is we still have to have a certain amount of flow. A pump does not like it when you try to force liquid through it and there's nowhere for it to go, right? Fluid's not compressible. If we have a pump running, these pumps are running all the time. If we keep trying to force fluid through it and there's no flow, what's gonna happen? It'll what? Potentially leak, right? What else? If you just keep pumping fluid in, pumping fluid in, pumping fluid in, what's it gonna do? It's gonna what? The pressure could just keep building, building, building until it bursts, right? What else is it going to do? What happens when you try to, or when you do pressurize something? It gets hot, right? So we've got a relief valve here that when there is no fluid flow required, this relief valve is set to open and allow fluid to bleed back to the return. What pressure do you think that relief valve is set to open at? right around 3,000 PSI or whatever your system pressure is. Okay, so it's going to crack open and bleed up. Now, the other thing is I mentioned the, the pump, what's another key feature of the pump that I mentioned right in the first slides? It's constant pressure and variable flow. So what's it gonna do to the flow when nothing's needed? It's going to slow it way down. It's going to go down as low as possible. So you're really not going to be leaking a ton of fluid, but there still has to be a little bit of fluid mo motion taking place. Okay. That way, and that's primarily for cooling. By moving that fluid, it's going to help keep things cool. The fluid in a hydraulic system, you know, it's providing pressure, but it's also providing the lubrication for everything. We use the hydraulic fluid itself. That's the oil to lubricate the pumps and to lubricate the actuators. And we use it for heat dissipation. That's what's going to carry away heat. 
It operates most items that move. So our primary and, flight, primary and secondary flight controls, landing gear, which can include things like extension, retraction, brakes, and steering, uh, doors, and thrust reversers. Here's another system makeup. How many systems are there in this diagram? Two, three, three. We've got three here. Right. In this case, this is more like the 727. Um, this is actually a, let me look at it and I can tell you. Yeah, I want to say it's an A320. Um, but it, I'm pretty sure it's an A320. I'm not 100% sure. But, you know, you can see there's three systems here. If we look at any one of them, here now we can see a little bit more detail, some of those things beyond just the users, okay? So we have, no, make sure I don't get ahead of myself here, yeah. We've taken this system, these three systems here, and we'll look at a single one of them. So here's our key elements. Remember I said you gotta have a place to store the fluid, we've got a reservoir. That can then send fluid to either one of our pumps, our engine driven pump and our AC motor pump. Okay, they can suck fluid, that's the suction side of the system in yellow or supply side of the system. Okay. Those pumps create pressure which is sent out and in both cases, where's it going here? Any ideas? What do they show? Do they show any of the users in here? Ah, there we go. Yep, it breaks off. It's the thrust reversers, the brakes. What's PFCS? Primary flight control surfaces, okay? Once it's been used, it goes into green, which is return, okay? Return goes back. Actually, I should have pointed out, after the pumps, we have, what are these things here? Comes out of the pump. What is that thing there? What do you think we do after a pump with this fluid? We filter it. In case a pump gets shells out, we don't want to send metal chunkies out to everything else, right? Because if we, say our AC motor pump shells out, right? We want to still be able to use our engine driven pump. If we send a bunch of metal chunkies out, we can follow up everything downstream. Okay. So we've got a filter after the AC motor pump. And then fluid comes back from our users. And what happens if one of these shells out? What do we want to do? We want to filter it before it goes back to our reservoir, right? Okay. So that's our return. Okay, pressure, return. Now there's another one here that they, they count as supply, but I, I put it separate. On your, um, on your uh, hydraulic schematic, I have something called case drain. Okay. And those are also in yellow on here. So you'll see there's a third line coming off of each pump. It's in yellow. It's flow coming out of the pump. What do you think that is? What did I just tell you hydraulic fluid does besides pressure? Provides heat dissipation and lubrication. So the fluid in the pumps that's used for lubrication and also picks up any heat generated in the pump, that goes through this, this case drain. And notice where it goes. What does it go through? A heat exchanger, that's where the cooling takes place. So the cooling doesn't actually take place in the pressure of the return side. It's this fluid that's siphoned off from the case drains. And then you can see it goes back into the return side as well. So kind of key parts of those. Okay. Very simple system here. More complex than a, a very simple system, but a fairly simple aircraft system. Now you're seeing all those, that list that I gave you. Do you see all those parts on it? Okay. Again, I don't remember if this is out of an A320 or out of a 737 or God knows whatever else aircraft, they all look pretty much the same. This one doesn't have one. 
It might have one down in the brake system, for instance. Um, some do, some don't. Not every aircraft is going to have accumulators. No. Return is, return is just free flow. Any pressure in it is going to be a result of just back pressure from the filters and resistance to flow due to the lines and that kind of thing. And a little bit of, there'll be a little bit of head pressure on the reservoir. You can see this one, it shows some air pressure pushing the fluid down. And so, yeah, that'll try to push back against it, but it's not much, it's like 25 PSI. Well, see, you got check valves there. So it, this comes out under some pressure and it's gonna take the path of least resistance Eventually, back to the. Back to that. There's the pump is pushing fluid in there, right? There's flow, but you don't have flow or you don't have pressure unless there's resistance to flow. Right, so there is there the pumps are moving fluid through that K, K strain side. They are pushing fluid through it, but they're the the engineers when they develop these they try to minimize any restriction as much as possible in the return side. So that's going to minimize the pressure on the return side and allow the fluid to flow back as easily as possible. So we saw this, I kind of went through it. Here's another aircraft, left, center, right. Um, again, I can't remember which one this is. I think this is the A320 because it's got a power transfer unit. A320s use a PTU for stab trim. That's that thing that if you're ever in an A320 and you hear a growling noise right before pushback, that's the uh, that's the growling noise. So if you're sitting by the wings, okay. So that kind of gives you general layout of the hydraulic systems. Next time we'll start moving into we'll start looking at the specifics. We'll go into specifics of each of these components. How are they designed? What kind of maintenance practices do they require? Uh, how do they operate? What's the theory behind them? Uh, as, as they fit in the system as a whole.